picture and um, Hollywood felt that the only way they could sell it unfortunately was as a horror film and it's not a horror film you know if you go to see a horror film you'd be terribly disappointed and, uh, but it's you know that's that's why it's so important to me when I was invited here I was like number one I'd love to see Norway and number two I think it's important that people know what I wanted the movie to be as opposed to what Hollywood thinks the movie is cause we disagree terribly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what would you call it if you don't call it a horror movie? Call it a, a fairy tale about um, thievery that goes on in obsessive relationships. It's a big metaphor for what disappears when we think we're in love with each other, but we're m more obsessed and trying to control one another so that we can feel safe and in love. But, you know, it, it always backfires on you. You've suddenly realized things, parts of you are missing, you know, and you don't know where they went. They went to him and, or his went to me, you know, because I've definitely put boyfriends of mine in boxes and they've certainly done the same to me. <laughs> We've both been guilty of that. And I had um, questions about that, why it was happening and what it was like. And um, it was an exploration. For me. That's why it's so weird to have so many people seeing it. I feel like there's people going through my underwear drawer in my bedroom, you know. <laughs> it's very surreal. <laughs> How did you actually get into the business? Um, I was intended to write novels all my life. And I was seeing a director at the time. And I came home from dinner one night. His phone was ringing. A friend of his was calling to see if he knew any female writers. He said, yeah, there's one in my living room. So I met with this guy. Um, <laughs> Philippe Calon, who eventually co-produced the movie. And he had a really violent one-line idea about a man who hacked off the arms and legs of a woman he was obsessed with, put her in a box and had sex with her. I didn't like the idea very much. And I sort of, I sort of felt that he was trying to excuse the content of the story by having a woman write it. it sort of made me feel funny. And I, I told him that, and I said that if I could make it something else, I'd be interested in doing it. And because I'd grown up around the statue of the Venus de Milo and was so amazed by how, even though she was broken, people looked at her like she was beautiful and whole. And so I tried to elaborate on that kind of idea. And I was coming out of relationships that were about, not intentionally about it, but ended up being about hurting each other and taking things from one another. And bumpity bump. And, uh, <laughs> So I was, you know, had these questions inside myself that I wanted to investigate and just study these two characters who had to be sort of dysfunctional. He had to be a little boy in a man's body who hadn't grown up emotionally. And she had to be sort of with that sick myth that we all are dealing with about the right way to make love, which is so funny to me because, you know, there's no right way to do it. As long as you're having fun and loving the person you're with, that's how it's done. At least that's what I think. So it was about analyzing all the pressures we put on ourselves. What happens when you um, see something in someone else that you don't see in yourself, and so you want to be around them, and you think that it's love, and you think that you need them, and when really it's more about when you look in the mirror, you don't see it in yourself. You can't really love somebody unless you like yourself, and they don't like themselves at all. <laughs> Just many ideas for the ending of the film. It always was going to be uh, ending the way it ended. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the imagination, and I don't think a good movie ending this way has happened since The Wizard of Oz. And a lot of high school and college students have sort of, sort of ruined dreams by ending their stories with the alarm went off. Um, and I think that we need to, at least for me, I have, you know, I'm thrilled by my dreams and, and have so much fun imagining things and thinking about them for as long as I can certainly something I got from my parents because they're very imaginative people and it was I thought it would be interesting to show how he used the image of this woman to criticize himself and challenge himself because he couldn't do it alone 
And then he realized, of course, that in real life, he might hurt her if he were with her. They don't belong together. But something about how potent her character was and how strong she was with him helped him sort of say, no, that's, that's baloney. That's not true about me, or this is true about me. Or, you know, I think that being a man or being a woman is as simple as looking in the mirror and saying, congratulations, you are one. And it's, um, I certainly have people in my life I need to stay away from because I'm obsessed with them, you know, not because I love them, but because I'm attracted to them for what I consider to be the wrong reasons, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> had mixed um, reviews, bad and good. Does it make you unhappy? No, not at all. I mean, I knew the minute I started typing that it was going to upset some people and, and make other people, you know, sort of dig it. It's not, it's not supposed to teach you anything you don't already know. It's just, like I said before, a very strange fairy tale about, you know, an observation. And because I thought it was going to be a, a small film, I felt braver to express some of the concerns and fears that I had. And I think it's, it's, I like hearing the bad because that's how I learn. I mean, this is the first thing I've ever done in film. So it's, I like hearing even the, the things people think are going to hurt or what have you. And sometimes they do, but it doesn't mean that there's not credibility to them. Because by, by however upset people are, then I realize what I've touched, you know, by doing certain things. And I, um, I mean, if I expected it all to be good, I'd be out of my mind. And I wouldn't want it to be, because then it would be totally boring. You know what I mean? But it's sort of a fun thing to explore. And I, that's why I appreciate my experience here, because even the people who have disliked the film have been fairly able to talk to me. People in London really weren't. They were very angry and, and just wanted to, like, walk out. And so hopefully, you know, six months from now, I can read the, re the reviews from London again and sort of look at them and try and analyze them myself since they didn't sort of welcome that participation on their own. Because for me, it's not about it all being perfect, you know? What's in that? Nobody ever grows, and I certainly wouldn't learn anything about what to do or what not to do again. So there be people knocking at your door asking you to make their movie for them? Uh, no. Um, you know, there's still the whole problem in L.A. with, you know, the way they view women. Um, and I'm, they sort of have me as, as this kind of sickening novelty item which is uh, David Lynch's daughter, young, female, the whole thing. It's never about the film. It's always about everything else, the trial. And I think the film suffers for that. I feel badly about it. It's like a child of mine that's sort of um, maybe mentally disabled or physically disabled, and he's going to go to a new school. <laughs> physically disabled, and he's going to go to a new school, and they've told the school there's this retarded boy coming, and, you know, you've got to be nice to him, or he's going to be like this, and it's going to be horrible, and... It's, even if my child came in and all that was wrong was one finger was funny, they'd still always call him retarded and never be able to just really meet him. I wish he could just go to school like every other kid goes to school, you know, and have that experience. And the, the people I was with at the Sundance Film Festival, almost every single one of the men there has gotten like three picture deals and offices at studios and nobody's picked up the phone and asked me to do that. So there's definitely coupling with the subject matter and my gender and all the rest. Woo! It's the most fun I've had. Um, the, you know, they, they, there's still a lot of sort of just so much. Uh, I don't know, it's interesting. Somebody in London said to me, if you were a little Japanese boy and you made this movie, they'd be calling you a genius. But you got five strikes against you. You're young, you're female, you're blonde, you're David Lynch's daughter, and your script's controversial. Just forget it. And I thought, oh, well, you know, great. So you're buying into it, too. What's the point of that? You know, can't you just look at the movie? I mean, if I had my way, my name wouldn't come up until after the film, and nobody would know. Because I, I like to go to movies not knowing anything and just sort of enjoy being told a story. You know, that's what it's about. You go into a dark room, and somebody tells you a great story. And even if you don't like it, if it's made me think, I appreciate it. You know, even if it just made me mad. At least I'm mad about something I wouldn't have been mad about before. You know, keeps the brain work, which is important. Got to keep that muscle going. <laughs> so do you think that being David Lynch's daughter has brought you good luck or bad luck? Personally, it's brought me good luck. Business, I think it's brought me, uh, you know, a fair amount of bad. 
um, you know, it's, it's, it feels good to be out here and hear people say, you know, say hi to your dad, I dig his movies, and that part's good. But I think that um, the town in Hollywood really makes it harder on you because they figure um, you, she's just a stupid little guy's daughter. And he's got all the talent. She just wants to sort of do what he does. And even if I'm never as talented as he is, all I want is the opportunity, like anybody else would, to, you know, do what you want to do. And I want to tell stories in paintings. I want to tell them in books. I want to tell them in films, if that's what happens. But it's, um, you know, he's, he's got to be my best friend in the whole world. He's one of the coolest guys on earth. So it's, it's good and bad, you know, but it's not... Most people would think that it'd be really easy for me to just slip in the door of Hollywood and get it done. And believe me, not only is that never easy, but they make it hard on you because they think you're just sort of the, you know, the flim-flam from the family. And, um, you know, Lord knows Sofia Coppola and all the other people who are sons of this. That's why Nicolas Cage changed his name, you know. And I, the only reason I didn't change mine is because I like it, <laughs> you know. Why buy into it? You know, I just didn't want to play the game any more than I had to. I'd already dyed my hair dark, tried to make myself look like, according to Hollywood standards, I suddenly had a brain when my hair was dark. You know, they were like, oh, they suddenly took me seriously. It was amazing. It was kind of sad, you know? I feel like they should take lessons from Norway. Almost everybody here's blonde. They're all smart, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I'm influenced by my mother. I'm influenced by my friends. Um, I think that um, if, if, if in any way in particular I'm influenced by him, too, is that he never said, this is good, this is bad. He said, come here and tell me how this makes you feel. And so from the day I was born, I had an opportunity to decide for myself what I liked and what I didn't like. And he never put those fences up around my imagination that I think a lot of people have where you say, oh, you shouldn't think that. You don't think those things whatever the heck you want to think so you don't want to think about it anymore you know and I think that it helps you if you balance your imagination <clears throat> sorry if you balance your imagination with reality um, you don't go out and shoot the boss you can go home drink a glass of water and pretend you strangled him just get it out of your system you know there's so many outbursts of anger in Los Angeles I think it has a lot to do somewhere with the fact that nobody reads anymore out there they're not using their own heads Everything on television that they watch all the time is always wrapped up perfectly. Everything's given to them, all the emotions. And they don't, they, there's very, a tremendous amount of disrespect for the imagination and for dreams and for that whole process, which I sort of was raised to believe is everything. You know, so it, absolutely he influenced me, I think, in some very good ways. Um, and I think he helped me, um, you know, learn how to take bad criticism. You know, I've certainly seen him like, die a thousand deaths reading bad reviews but he always says well it's a good thing it wasn't their Christmas present because <laughs> then they'd really be bummed out so you know it's it's if if you made it for them then it would hurt a lot but if you know if it's something you've done for you and at least parts of it you can be proud of you know that's what makes it exciting and even when one person comes up and say hey I really had a good time you know I dug it that you know means the world inspire you to write Laura Palmer's diary? Um, actually, uh, his partner, Mark Frost, called me and said, I haven't spoken to your father yet, but I know you're sensitive about working with him. Um, but I, you know, I wanted to know if you wanted to write Laura's diary. And I said, absolutely, totally. So then they told him, and he called me up. He said, so you're going to do this diary thing, huh? And uh, it was very funny because I went into he, the two of them, Mark Frost and my father, took me into a room, gave me a red pen, made me sign this oath of secrecy. He said, now you're one of three air-breathing mammals in the world. You know this. My father leaned over and he says, her father killed her. And Mark goes, oh, this is weird. So, um, and then they said, you know, her father killed her, go write the book. I had total creative freedom on that, which was really nice. It was, you know, a gift, because I got to be someone else who was in a lot of trouble. And I didn't have those kinds of troubles. I had different kinds of troubles, so it was kind of, it was good to play somebody else's voice, you know. It was a lot of fun. Laura was very sad. It's kind of an interesting thing to investigate. She had all these dreams about what she'd do when she got older, and I knew ahead of time, obviously, that she died. And so it was, it was, you know, interesting to give her all those questions that we all have and all the crushes that you have on boys, 
nightmares and all that stuff and um, to know the whole time that she was going to be killed. Did you ask many questions in that book which you often wanted to ask yourself or have asked yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I mean, I look back on my own diaries, talk to my girlfriends about when certain things happened for them and when they had the first fantasies, the first nightmares about this, and when they started thinking certain thoughts. And um, I, I realized that all the girls I knew, including myself, had these fears like, is this how everybody else feels? And I'd always had this fantasy, especially when I was around nine years old, of finding someone else's diary. And I wanted to put it under my jacket, take it home and read and see if I was crazy or if everybody was feeling the way I was feeling. And, um, you know, so it was a good, experience. It's nice. I got a lot of letters from young girls and from their parents saying thank you. Made my daughter relax, you know. <laughs> it's a little racy, but that's okay. And uh, it, was, it was a nice way to participate because it was my own project, but within a series that I think was brilliant, you know. There's a big difference uh, between your opinion of Boxing Elena and Hollywood's. Does it uh, scare you? Are you surprised? Uh, surprise? No. <laughs> Does it scare me? Yes. Uh, you know, and I, Hollywood by nature is not a bad place at all, but I think that it used to be controlled by the artists. You know, Billy Wilder could come in and say, I got this great idea about this movie called Sunset Boulevard, you know, Bill Holden and Dead Monkey and Dying Movie Star and, you know, they'd never let him make that today because the suits run it now, you know, it's the executives and what television series of the 50s can we recycle and make a hundred million dollars on by sticking a bunch of movie stars in it and not that that isn't entertaining but it can't be the only thing happening and Hollywood just heard Lynch and they heard arms and legs box and they said horror film and I remember talking to this one reporter in Los Angeles who called me and he said you know I want to write an article for tomorrow's paper can you tell me what the movie's about I spent an hour and a half on the phone with the guy, and the next morning I pick up the paper and it says, Boxing Elena about a guy who chainsaws his girlfriend's arms and legs off, puts her in a box, has sex with her. I called him up and said, why did you talk to me? He says, hey, I'm selling papers, and hung up. So, you know, there you have it. There's, there's, um, you know, it, they will do what they want to do. And I, I, you know, I don't think they realize how smart the world is. I know I'm competing with five and a half years of people's imaginations. You guys have heard about it. You've already made the movie the way you want to see it. And I just am here to remind everybody that I wish I could give you everything you wanted, but I can only sort of welcome you to my interpretation of it. And I'm sorry it took me so long <laughs> to do it, and you had to hear so much about it. You know, I think that it kind of ruins it. Like when somebody says, hey, man, it's a great movie. It'll blow your mind. It'll never blow your mind, you know, because somebody's already raised your expectations so high. And so it's, you know, but it's interesting. I've heard a lot of really good, bad things and really good, good things, you know, and I try and take the value of all of them and, you know, learn as much as I can from it. Hopefully get better at what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Why do you prefer to meet us here instead of a small hotel lunch and it's done in one hour and you can pass on to another city? This is a heck of a lot more fun, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, why not? And I, 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 people keep saying that I'm one of the first directors who come here and all these little... I can't believe that. They're nuts. This is beautiful. I've seen them, you know, heaven on earth since I've been here in Norway. And people have been welcoming. I've been treated better than I've ever been treated in my whole life. People treat me like a queen and, you know, put me in big cars, drive me around. I, you know, and it's, it's, um, I've never been to Europe and everybody over here has got a very open mind. And I, you know, I know you guys have 100% literacy and, you know, imaginations. I think it's great. Why do it in an hour at a cheesy hotel? <laughs> Boring. It must be the first time you have been uh, interviewed by a TV station with such a small TV camera. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I'm used to even teenier. But hey, um, no, it, you know, it's, it's uh, good to be here on the boat with all of you, getting cozy. <laughs> in the little downstairs cabin. <laughs> Something less uh, cozy. Everybody in Norway has heard about this court case with Kim Basinger. 
but uh, nobody uh, actually knows what it was all about. Maybe you could uh, clarify that a bit. Absolutely. Um, it's a funny thing because when, uh, whoa, when, <laughs> well, um, both Madonna and Kim, one of the first things I said to them was that Oxygen Lane was a small film and I didn't want it to be the next Madonna movie or the next Kim Basinger movie. And they were very happy with that because they wanted to sort of spread their wings as actresses in a small area. And when you're feeling brave, you're also feeling vulnerable, I think. And when the people around them realized they weren't going to make any money on this and there was a lot of risk involved because both being very physical women without their bodies, they had only their voice and their eyes to rely on. And so pe all people had to do was say, but honey, what if you fail? What if something goes wrong? What if they laugh at you? And so slowly but surely it turned into fear instead of bravery. And I don't think, I mean, I have no hard feelings at all towards Kim or Madonna. I think that, you know, they made a decision they felt they had to make. And, you know, certainly I was a key witness. I'm not the one who sued them. I don't get any of the money, so there's no hard feelings there. But I. I do feel badly because I feel like the people around them took from them the opportunity to sort of just try something. You know, I mean, the, we're all so afraid of failing all the time. I'm surprised we get out of bed. You know, we all deserve a pat on the back for, for saying, well, who decides it's a failure? Maybe it's just a lesson, you know? You try and be better at things. But if I was worried all the time about whether or not somebody would laugh at me, you know, I'd never leave the house. People laugh at me all the time. You know, I'm a goofball. I'm learning my way through life, you know? So it's, it was when the fact that she felt she couldn't admit, look, you know, things have changed for me and I can't give you the performance we talked about and the one I promised you, um, but I'll make sure that my departure won't taint the film and make it seem like a bad film. She could have settled for very little money and just walked away. But I think, I, you know, sometimes for people, they don't realize, even though it's hard to say, I changed my mind, I made a mistake. You do it and it's over. It's a lot better than wasting millions of dollars in a court case. I mean, courtrooms should be for murderers, not for actors and, and producers who can't work it out. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's embarrassing, you know? It's a shame. It was an interesting experience being in the witness stand for two and a half days, but it's not fun, you know? And I don't think it was money well spent. And I feel badly for her because I know she's not a happy person now. You know, so it's it's a shame. Why did you choose Sherilyn Fenn? Because she was the first person I met after Kim's departure who didn't say, I'm brave, I'm brave, I'm brave, I'm brave, because I know that's a, a bad sign. I think if you go around talking about how brave you are, you're saying it because you're afraid. And Sherilyn said, this terrifies me. I have to do it. And I knew she and I would learn, you know, a lot together, even if we learned that we should have done it differently. So it was some... Um, you know, that excited me. She was as, as scared as I was to do it, but as eager as I was. And it wasn't about money for her, and it was sort of about growing. And I know that it's her favorite film she's ever done. She's really excited, which makes me feel good. You know, thank God she's not saying, oh, why'd I do that? <laughs> so, you know, and I think she gave a beautiful performance. I'm writing a book next. I need to take a break. Six years is a long time on one movie. And it was very exhausting and it sort of destroyed a lot of my personal relationships. You realize that some people around you are worried because they don't want you to fail. And other people around you expect you to fail for their own benefit. And it helps you sort of, you know, very sadly, um, my personal relationship with my boyfriend broke up and I, want, I need to kind of chill out. I'm going to write a book for a while and, you know, think about, make sure that the next film I make is something I love as much as I love this. And just in case it takes another six years, I better like it a whole lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just uh, keep telling stories in whatever way, you know, they'll let me. And write a book about a uh, different kind of love, healthier. A little bit sick, but healthier than this. <laughs> dreaming in it. Uh, no, uh, a little couple of dreams, but not as relevant as this dream was. <laughs> Did you see what he said? 
done to me. From director Jennifer Chambers Lynch. I'll just climb right off the hill. Uh -huh. Right up there. Where I'm getting married. <laughs> Whoever the lucky guy is, call me. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like a mouse. Ponsky. Kör stansmässig och leja limousin är rimligare än du kanske tror. Kör stansmässig. Ring PO Executive 04 65 51 46. <laughs> ja, kanske jag kan hjälpa dig med att hålla den. Ja, det är fint. Oj, lång. Ja, det... Kan du kutta den där? Nej. Var det den snabben som sticker upp där, eller? Girstangen. Ja, den kan du bara fjärna, den har jag inte för. Ja, det... Veldig bra dette her du. Bare du kan ta så spissen litt foran, så blir det lettere for meg å treffe garasjen. Hvor mange hester har du her da? 150. Det er litt lite du. Vi sier 300 vi, og så leverer du på torsdag. Umulig når det gjelder bil. Fullt mulig når det gjelder PC. Sinet lanserer sin egen PC. Satt sammen i Norge nøyaktig slik du vil ha den. Nå er den nye katalogen fra HTH kjøkkenforum kommet. Den er full av praktiske, vakre og moderne kjøkken, bad, garderober og tilbehør. Her kan du bla opp og se nyhetene, fargene, utvalget og ikke minst de lave prisene. Hos Midtbø på Lagersveien kan du se de forskjellige kjøkkenene, badene og garderobene og tilbehøret i utstillingen. Her får du også hjelp med planløsning og fargesammensetning. Og selvfølgelig får du med deg den nye kjøkkenkatalogen. Helt gratis. Midtbø på Lagersveien. Velkommen innom.